Hey guys, Spirit of the Law here. In this video, we're going to chat about the developments going on in Age of Empires 4 with the upcoming DLC, including the new Civ variants, what I like about what they're doing, but why other parts feel like there's lots of potential here that's being missed out on. If you haven't been following AOE 4, last week they announced Japanese and Byzantines would be added to the game in the next DLC. And we'll start by quickly recapping the info about those civs and then get into the civ variant discussion. To start, the DLC, titled The Sultan's Ascend, is coming out November 14th and will be 15 US dollars. You might be wondering what Sultans have to do with Byzantines or especially Japanese, and instead the title seems to refer to a new 8 mission campaign, where you'll play as the Muslims resisting the invading crusaders, specifically mentioning the First Crusade along with fighting holy orders of the Templars, Hospitallers, the Teutons, and the Mongols. Byzantines could make an appearance in that, but obviously Japanese were just added as a fan favorite. To take a quick look at those new civilizations, starting with the Japanese, they have some pretty good looking samurai units, including the ability to switch between melee and ranged mode, with their sashimonos on their back identifying which mode they're in. This is probably my favorite screenshot released, and the units look pretty good. They also have a shinobi ninja-like unit that is going to be able to disguise itself and is used for espionage and assassination apparently. I've seen other games do something similar, where you have a spy unit that looks to your opponent like one of their villagers, but can be revealed by outposts or some other mechanic. I noticed there's a pretty heavy cavalry focus for Japanese by the looks of it, which greatly differs from AOE2's interpretation as an infantry and archer civ, though Japanese are one of my favorite civs in both Age of Empires 2 II and 3, so personally I'm happy to give them a chance in AOE4 as well. The other new civilization is the Byzantines of course, with their own unique mechanics. They have the ability to make networks of aqueducts and cisterns, which is implied to me in the screenshots to give a bonus to nearby farms. Notice they have farms beside each cistern, and also note their farms are olive trees, just for a little extra thematic immersion. I am a little confused by the aqueducts, which are meant to transport water from high altitude mountains and springs down to a city. It almost reminds me of an AI generated image, where it knows to include things that look like aqueducts, but doesn't understand how they work, so you get random nonsensical aqueducts placed everywhere that wouldn't actually function. The Byzantines units look decent though, and we get to see some Byzantine cataphracts in action, as well as some battering rams with long distance Greek fire, clearly as a unique tech for Byzantines. They also have a mercenary mechanic as well, so are maybe able to purchase units from other civilizations, plus a quote new resource, which may be connected to their unique farms or Greek fire. So far so good though, and this is all relatively similar to what I think most people would have predicted a few weeks back from the first trailer. But they've also announced in addition to the two civs and campaign, there'll be four new variant civilizations, which is mostly what I want to talk about. First of all, what is a variant civilization? Well, strangely enough, they didn't immediately explain what they were, leading to tons of speculation and guessing on the forums over the last week. Enough so that to start this week, there's been some official clarification on what they are. These are in fact new civilizations based on existing ones in the game, but are going to be changed enough to play significantly differently. To be completely clear, these are playable in ranked, so effectively the DLC has 6 civilizations it can boast if you consider these variations distinct, and AOE4 players will go from 10 to 16 civs to pick from when playing single player or online. Now, one might suspect, given the theme of the DLC is Sultan's Ascend, and they mentioned fighting Templars, Hospitallers, and Teutons, that these would be three of the variants. As an example, Knight's Hospitaller might be very similar to the French, but with more of a reliance on healing game mechanics, reskinning the regular French units into a Crusader theme, and swapping a couple of bonuses or landmarks perhaps. One of the screenshots even seemed to be in line with this, and it was the easiest layup in the world to just introduce crusader-centric variations of English, French, Holy Roman Empire, and Abbasids that you could use in the campaigns but are also playable online and have mostly cosmetic changes, with maybe a couple new landmarks or units. It feels like a slam dunk and the crusades would sell themselves, but instead here's what they went with. First, Abbasids are getting a variation themed around Saladin and the Crusades, which was initially called the Sultan's Army, but is now named after an actual civilization that represents the same thing. We don't know any specifics, but the first one looks Crusader themed, so it gets a check mark. The second is the Order of the Dragon. I know I hadn't heard of it either, but it's at least related to fighting the Ottomans, even if it's kind of obscure and not related to the First Crusade. Not sure why they went with this over Teutonic Order for example as the Holy Roman Empire variant, but again, maybe it's good enough. 
The next variant for this seemingly crusader-themed DLC is for China. Originally, they went with the title Empire of Jade, which is not something that ever existed. But after responding to criticism, they switched to Zhu Xi's legacy. They specifically describe this as a what-if of a civilization following the Neo-Confucianism of Chinese philosopher Zhu Xi. Admittedly, they kind of put themselves in a box already by having the default Chinese civilization include multiple dynasties, so it was always going to be hard to come up with a variant. But again, what does this have to do with sultans or crusades? I understand wanting to move out of Europe, but surely this would make more sense in a future DLC set in the China region. The fourth one is, and I kid you not, you probably already heard if you follow AOE4 News, it's Joan of Arc. Yes, the civilization Joan of Arc. The premise is that Joan of Arc lived at the start of the Age of Gunpowder in Europe, but they wanted to take her and do a what if, supposing she'd been present at different time periods. The way they describe it, Joan of Arc is a hero unit you get every game that starts as a villager, but levels up over time, where you can give her a sword or bow, and after reaching level 3, she can pick up companions to summon, finally with a hand cannon in level 4. I also have to assume that she can be revived if she's killed, similar to the Mongols' Khan. I'll give them points for creativity and being willing to step outside the box, but it's a surprising departure from the initial premise that Age of Empires IV was going to lean heavily into being historically authentic wherever possible. Remember, we were supposed to be getting college credit at University of Arizona because it was so historically educational. Having done a history video about the Joan of Arc campaign in AoE 2, I remember reading she claimed she preferred carrying a banner into battle over a sword, and said at her trial she never killed anyone. So mounted gunner Joan of Arc sniping peasants is some pretty wild alt history, though maybe if it's fun enough people will just look the other way. The reason all of this is just so surprising is because a Crusade DLC felt like such a slam dunk. Byzantines plus four Crusader themed variations for English, French, Holy Roman Empire, and Abbasids is a perfectly fine standalone DLC, and they could have saved Japanese, Koreans, and a Chinese variant for an East Asian DLC next spring. Now, with that said, the idea of Civ variants conceptually is, in my opinion, a very good one, and I'd argue proactively handles two issues that AOE4 has or will probably have in the future. The first issue is by design they were incredibly ambitious in both the almost documentary style of the campaigns, as well as the variation between civilizations, where each one was going to be completely different than the others. Every new Civ added required new skins for units, buildings, brand new mechanics, and tons of research into languages that even reflect the evolution within that specific culture. I have to think the team working on AOE4 has decreased in size, if anything, since release, especially considering the large cut in the price of the game, which means new content that takes that long to make is very slow to come out, and they risk players just moving on from a lack of content. Instead, adding in Civ variations, repackaging that existing work as new Civs feels more on the level of modding the game, as you can reuse a lot of the time-intensive portion and get a whole new Civ just by changing a few Civ bonuses and detailing in the unit skins, which can be done quickly with a comparatively small development team. The other issue this addresses is an inherent problem faced by AoE 3 and AoE 4 in my opinion, that AoE 2 manages to avoid, which is players fixating on a small number of civilizations and only exploring a sliver of what the game offers. We actually have some data on this for Age of Empires 2, and in this chart we see ranked players who have more than 20 recent ranked games and how often those players picked their most used civilization. It turns out AoE 2 players don't really main a civilization in general, with only 0.2% of players playing the same civilization 90% of the time or more. Basically, no one plays just one Civ in ranked AoE 2 for an extended period, and likewise only 8% play one civilization in over half their games, which means 11 out of 12 ranked players are playing at least 3 civilizations regularly. In fact, nearly two-thirds of the player base uses their favorite civilization less than 20% of the time, meaning the vast majority play at least six, and probably more than ten, civilizations in regular rotation. The reasons why seem pretty obvious. Different maps favor different civilizations, so if you get Arabia, you likely have different preferences than Nomad or Black Forest. But it also speaks to how easy it is to move between civs, giving players an easy source of variety and flavor. Games like Age of Empires 3 and especially AoE 4 that has made a point of having totally different civilizations just don't lend themselves to that kind of constant rotation. I don't have the hard numbers unfortunately, but expect it would look more like this for AoE 4, with a subset of players truly happy going random or rotating civilizations, 
but many more players have a clear favorite they play more than half the time. The point here is that a lot of AoE4 players are incentivized to become specialists in one civilization because learning new ones is a big task, and this is where we get back to my point that civ variations done right could bring a lot to the game. If you only play French and Night Rush every game, a new DLC giving the game Byzantines and Japanese probably doesn't do a lot for you because you'll keep playing French. If though a new Civ is a very slight tweak on the French, say Knights Hospitallers, not with any completely different Joan of Arc hero system, but just some reskinned units, two new landmarks, and one bonus being swapped out, suddenly you're probably comfortable adding that new Civ to your repertoire, and avoids players picking one variant over the other every time, which a more polarizing change might encourage. Admittedly, you lose a bit of the every Civ is totally different thing that AB4 was originally going for, and still seems to be doing even with the variants. But realistically, if there's 16, 20, or eventually 30 civilizations in AB4 that are all completely different, then how many of those Civs are most players going to feel competent enough to use online? I think you're likely to have players explore more of the game if there are say 12 base civilizations and 3 additional variations on each that are similar enough players can easily adjust between them. All this to say, I really feel like the Civ variance idea is genius, but I'm not sold to utilizing it to the maximum potential and are using it as a way to save developer time and not to increase replayability if they try to make them as different as they imply. Of course, admittedly Joan of Arc is the only one we have a decent amount of detail on, and it's possible others are going to be closer to their main civilization, which I think would be a smart decision. A Crusade DLC likewise is a great idea on paper, but with all over the place execution, throwing Japanese and even Chinese content in there. I'm curious to hear where you guys are at though, and if you think I'm being fair, or if you like the direction they've gone in. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.